All right, welcome to, what is this, April 3rd, 2 p.m. section, recording is on. Uh, today, what we're going to focus on primarily is continuing to work on the as-is valuation model, which we are currently working on for Starbucks. We'll do three more files, which is the bull, the bear, and the target, <coughs> and finishing up how we finish the process of valuation for a company. Uh, on Wednesday, you will once again practice in class, doing all this in another company, and then that will get you ready for homework 10, which is due one week from today, doing evaluation on yet another company, which I'll assign on Wednesday individually. Okay. And coming up on April 26th, uh, you'll be making an in-class presentation, group project three, on a publicly traded company you'll do as a group project. Okay. So lots of stuff coming up. Before we do get to that though, I just want to just quickly check in on the Bloomberg Trading Challenge which has been running now for a week. And today's the day you have to be out of cash. So looking, this is section 301. So very important, you can't have more than 300,000 in cash. So this team has until the end of today to get out of cash. You're still above the 300,000 threshold to buy something even though it's only about $1,000. And so again, all your longs have reset. You need at least 10 longs for the second half of the semester. It looks like everybody has already met that threshold. And this would be the portfolio values as of today. But as I said, starting after today, you can't have 300,000 or more of cash. You have to be under $300,000 okay, for the rest of the semester. Any questions about the trading challenge? One other deadline is that uh, originally the deadline was last week for doing any peer reviews on the historical project. I forgot to mention that last week. So I'm extending the peer review deadline through tomorrow. So if you need to fill out any peer reviews, feel free to, to submit those under the link uh, by tomorrow for the historical project. Right. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about homework nine. Right. So when you did homework nine, uh, what you should have done is first of all, you should have exported the data for Starbucks, okay? Which means you would have created your model in Bloomberg, you'd have exported it to Excel, you would have basically turned all the field lookups into numbers, and you'd have gotten rid of the long dashes, replaced those with zeros, okay? So that should have created that file. Now I know some of you might have had trouble last week, because unfortunately, IT and their infinite wisdom <laughs> decided that there were too many plugins on all these applications in this lab to different pieces of software, so they decided to segregate plugin by version of Excel. So they created their own version of Excel with the Bloomberg add-in. Uh, you have to get to it through the download folder on one of these desktops, and if you're going to export data, you have to open that first, then log into Bloomberg to export the data. Okay. So if you don't load the version of Excel with a plug-in, it's just going to error out, when it, which is what many of you experienced last week. Sorry, they forgot to tell anybody that they made this change, but now that we know about this, you should be okay. We're also at the beginning of April, which means all the data export limits should have reset over the weekend, and so at least for the next couple weeks, you shouldn't have trouble getting data out of the machines. Okay. That being said, did anybody have any challenges you wanted to ask about? All right, so assuming you got this file, you would then select this whole file, copy paste special values to the first file of your model data tab, and basically overwrite cell for cell the data to put in Starbucks data, right? Make some additional changes. First, look at this last column here. Starbucks reported their last year as 2022. So when we go to assumptions, I don't have to change the last reported year. However, if we do run into a company that starts reporting 2023 results, then we would have to change the last reported year. Okay? But nonetheless, we didn't have to do that. It will auto-adjust the model. Next, from our screenshots, we needed their WAC. At the time I did my WAC, I think it was last Thursday, it was around 8%. That was what was on my screenshot, so I updated their WAC. Uh, we also had to update their shares outstanding from the DES screen, 1,149.3 million. 
And again, at the time I was doing my screenshots, the share price was 101.16. One of the reasons, again, why you're doing the screenshots is the, the valuations could change based on when you did it, right? Different share prices, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, different share prices even during the day, okay? So again, keying off of the share price on your DES screen and even the WAC could change slightly throughout the week, right? But nonetheless, at the time, my share price was 101.16. <clears throat> as I said, our goal in the as is is to get within $1, although the process I gave you last week with goal seek should be exact to that share price, whatever it is you did your valuation on. And then the third one was the EEO. Okay, so you'd have gone here for Starbucks. You've gone to EEO. On the second tab here for headline growth, you would have put in these growth rates for the next five years, first four are on this page, move over one period to get the fifth year, go back to headline, and then put in for the five years the revenue and the EBITDA in dollars for the five years. That would have been these numbers, okay? Which we had the growth rates and EBITDA divided by revenue would have given us the EBITDA margin for the five years, which we can see that the analysts are forecasting it to grow substantially from 19.4% this year to an EBITDA margin of 24.6% by 2027. Okay. Next, we would have gone to the ratios tab. Again, probably for purposes of the as is, we could have left the balance sheet ratios alone. So the next would have been the tax rate. Again, if we looked up tax rate for Starbucks, GUID would be guidance. Last time they gave tax rate guidance was the end of 2022, which is 24.5%. That's the number that I used. I heard a couple of students said they used the JP Morgan one, which is 24.9. You're not going to get a substantial difference, but either 24.9 or 24.5. Something in that range is probably what you should have put in for your tax rate. Okay. Now, next, these EBITDA margins and growth rates would have adjusted based on your EEOs. And then so the final step would have been to go back to assumptions and solve for a G. So using goal seek, you came up with a 4.3% G. Okay. So basically that's what got the share price to match. All right, that was the process for homework nine. Questions about any of that? Why we did it, what we did? Yes, sir? Uh, for operating cash percentage of revenue, does that not change for this? We're going to leave it at 2%, which is basically one week of sales uh, for most companies. And, and I can tell you, I was the chief financial officer for a company, and we would have gone bankrupt long before we hit zero cash, right? Because when you start running low on cash, you just have trouble in a working capital sense, waiting on invoices to come in, paying vendors with the float. So that, that's the point. Companies don't go bankrupt at zero cash. They go bankrupt below zero cash. So to be honest with you, 2% might even be aggressive. <laughs> like having more than a week of cash might be necessary for most companies. But nonetheless, we're leaving 2% as a placeholder, as a minimum. Now, if you want to adjust it, want to adjust it up, which will essentially have the impact of putting in more work and capital and lowering the ROIC, you could always do that if you felt better about a company. In fact, McKinsey talked about in the book that one of the ways they do is they kind of regress all the cash balances across the firm and across the industry over time to get a sense of what that operating cash would be. To be honest with you, the easiest way to do, talk to a CFO or treasurer. Like, they know. But just ask the company, like, how much cash do you need to kind of run the business? They kind of know, right? But for our purposes, I would say 2% is probably a reasonable assumption we could leave it alone. Any other questions about your process, what you changed? All right, <clears throat> so here's the point. That's what you needed to do for homework nine. This is where we're going to pick up and make some adjustments to our model today, right? So just taking a 30,000 square foot point of view, we've done with an as is a DCF valuation based on Medigliani Miller. The idea is we observe and know the share price in the real world using that share price, working backwards, what assumptions and cash flows equal that share price. That's the whole point of the as is, right? Now, if you look at the DCF tab for Starbucks, what that meant is, of their $140 billion of enterprise value, 
141 billion was operating value, and about negative one and a half billion was non-operating value. And that's pretty typical for most companies, meaning the vast majority of the value is the operating value. Okay? And the vast majority of the operating value, which is based on free cash flow, is the continuing value period. All right? In five years, they generate $15.8 billion worth of free cash flow value. In year six into perpetuity, it's $141 billion, or sorry, $126 billion of free cash flow value. So the vast majority of a company's operating value is going to be in a perpetuity period. That's just common. Right? What it means, though, in this formula on the right of the page, is that key value driver formula is going to be critical in our valuation. Because 80 to 90% of a value is continuing value, and those four numbers are going to be key to that long-term operating value. Okay? So we want to get those as right as possible. Now, what we did in homework nine is we said, OK, WAC, that's pretty constant over a valuation period. And 8% seemed reasonable, so we didn't really muck around with that. Now, Bloomberg is fallible. And every now and then, Bloomberg is going to create some crazy whack that makes no sense. If it ever does, we'd have to put in a reasonable whack. That's not the case of Starbucks. I think 8% is reasonable. So therefore, we would use the whack and probably not change that. So I'm pretty comfortable with the whack. Right? But what also becomes important is the growth in the ROIC. Okay? And the idea here was that the ROICs tend to be more stable over time. So therefore, we solve for the G. All right? But as you can play around with a model, a slight change in G has a very big impact on a company share price. And so most companies are going to be very sensitive to whatever that G is. Right? And so that's a problem. It's, it's kind of a, it's called, it's a broadsword. Right? It's not a scalpel. And, and so estimating a G is really important to the model. Estimating an ROC is important to the model. But generally, G is the hardest. Okay? So here's what we're going to do. <clears throat> Looking ahead, in finance, there's something called the law of one price, which says no matter what way we value a company, there's only one value of the company. So if we change our approach, we should still come up with the same valuation. Now, the fourth section of this class is called multiples. And the key to multiples, as a look ahead, is that multiples are just rearranged math of a DCF. So we do a multiples valuation, price to earnings, as an example, we should get the same answer as a cash flow valuation. We shouldn't get a different answer. All right? And so on that premise, we are going to use the real world multiples to help us triangulate some of the assumptions in our as is valuation. Meaning the assumptions for growth in ROIC and the multiples should be the same assumptions for the growth in ROIC in the cash flow. Okay, we shouldn't have different assumptions because we have a different methodology. We should still have the same core numbers for a company, the same value for a company. So with that in mind, a look ahead and a look back. All right? During the first week of class, when we derived the key value driver formula, we did a little exercise, company A and a B, where I showed as you change growth at ROIC, it changed the value and the multiples of company. And what I tried to link back in the first week of class was the idea is that multiples are an expression of the key value driver formula. Right? And that's what we're going to be talking about, as I said, in our fourth section of the class. But with that in mind, and this is already in lecture note six, this is the key value driver equation we've been using all semester, including continuing value. If we rearrange the math, this is the enterprise value to EBIT multiple. Okay? And so that's the point. Like, all multiples are just rearranging the key value driver equation in perpetuity. That's all they are. So that's the whole point. Same values, same numbers, just change the order of operations, and that's what creates a multiple. So for example, to go from the key value driver equation to enterprise value to EBIT, that's the derivation. That's how you get to EV to EBIT. Okay? Matter of fact, when we do a PE multiple, what we're going to do is we're going to take the enterprise or the key value driver formula and we're just going to replace it with equity values. So no plat becomes net income, ROIC becomes ROE, growth in cash flow becomes growth in earnings, 
and we discounted a cost of equity instead of a WAC, but it's the exact same formula. That's the formula for a PE right there on the screen. Okay? This is the formula. Sorry, a little mouse trouble here. For the enterprise value to revenue multiple. Start with the key value driver formula, rearrange it, and you get this monster at the bottom, which is basically the EV to revenue formula. It's just the key value drivers rearranged. Right? And importantly, this part of the key value drivers formula, when we rearrange it, is the more is the formula for the EV to EBIT multiple. So that and this is a shortcut, which we'll spend more time on in a few weeks. The enterprise value to revenue multiple equals the perpetuity operating margin times the EV to EBIT multiple. Okay, that's just kind of the way the math plays out. So that's what we're going to start with today. Okay, so I know key value drivers explain multiples. I know that I can rearrange the key value driver formula to get the formula for different multiples. And using the rearranged formulas and using the real world multiple data, I can back into the G and the ROIC for the multiples, just like I backed into a G and an ROIC for the cash flow valuation we just did. And I can compare them because they should be the same. Okay? So this is what I mean by triangulation. So we'll use the real world multiples to help us understand and get a better understanding of our as is valuation model. Okay? Make sense conceptually? Here's the other thing. When we do multiples, we, carry, we care more about forward multiples than historical multiples, right? And the reason why is because companies' valuations are based on future cash flows, right? So therefore, the future multiples are more indicative of future cash flows than historical multiples, meaning I care less about your 2022 PE based on 2022 earnings than I do about your 2023 PE based on expected earnings. That is more predictive. So in Bloomberg, on the EEO screen, it calculates on the split screen forward multiples. Scroll down. They're right here. So for example, this is the price to earnings multiple for Starbucks, real time. Okay. Current share price, 104.37 a share. So here's the deal. For 2023 PE, right here, the way he calculates it, take the current share price, divided by 2023 earnings per share, price divided by earnings, so 104.37 divided by 339 is a PE of 30.78. Okay, take same share price, 104.37 divided by 24 EPS, 456, PE of 25.73. Okay. Take forecast for 24 EBIT, 65.58. Okay. Take the enterprise value of Starbucks, divide by 65.58, EV to EBIT in 2024 is 21.42. Okay. So that's kind of how you calculate a forward earnings. You just take the current values, market value, enterprise value, divided by the future earnings, and that gives you a forward PE, forward EV to EBIT, forward EV to sales. Okay? And so in Bloomberg parlance, FY23, this column, is forward year one. FY24 is forward year two, forward year three. Okay, just count the columns, one, two, three. Now, here's the other thing about forward years. What McKinsey says, based on their historical data, is that forward multiples are better predictors of price, and clean forward multiples are better predictors of price than less clean ones. Now, I'll tell you what I mean by dirty multiples. 2023, which is forward year one, has both historical data and forecast data mixed in. Okay, we're part of the way through 2023, so therefore we got half actual data, half <coughs> forecast data. Okay, I call that a dirty year. Right? The next year, 2024, is 12 months of just forecast. Right? 
And what McKinsey says is when they look at all these multiples over time, multiples tend to normalize for companies and industries based on pure forecast years. So the two years that we're going to be more concerned about in this class are forward year two and forward year three multiples. For Starbucks, 2024 and 2025. Does that make sense? Questions about that? Okay, so here's the deal. I know from the rearranged math that if I take the enterprise value to revenue multiple and I divide by the enterprise value to EBIT multiple, I will get the company's margin in perpetuity. And that margin is the EBIT margin, AKA operating margin in perpetuity. Translation, in our model, on the ratios tab, this is the EBIT operating income margin and this is the perpetuity year. So it basically tells me what number should be in M19. And M19 is very critical to the company's value because that's going to drive the margin in the ROIC in the continuing value period, which is the biggest part of the value. So I want to get that margin right. So the question is, is 19.8% a good number for operating margin in perpetuity? Okay. Well, the trading multiples are going to help answer that question. So here's what we're going to do on our assumptions tab. On our assumptions tab, forward year two is 2024, forward year three, 2025, and I want to know the EV to revenue, let me spell revenue correctly, and the EV to EBIT numbers for those two years because that will get me my estimated EBIT, also known as operating margin. Now, <clears throat> we are using EBIT margin and operating margin in this class interchangeably with the assumption that companies are not throwing non-operating items into their EBIT. All right. If companies were to throw non-operating items in their EBIT, we would have to adjust them out. Okay, and that's why Bloomberg actually will report two numbers. They'll report an EBIT margin and they'll report an operating margin. So if the company actually does have some non-operating items in there, they'll adjust them out when they do their operating margin. But most companies don't do that. So for simplicity, we assume the EBIT margin is the operating margin. Okay, but technically if it's not, we, we need to use operating margin. Okay, so back to this. For these two years, I'm going to make these cells yellow. And I'm going to grab them off of the EEO screen. Now, when you did your EEO screenshot, it was the split screen. So your multiples would be on that screenshot. Okay? And it's actually important, although I'm going to cheat today, to basically do the multiples as of the time of the valuation, okay? Because here's the point. When the share price changes, the multiples change. Does that make sense? So therefore, if you're going to try and sync up this multiple analysis with the share price, you need to do it based on what those multiples were at the time of that share price. That's why it's also important to pull them off of your EEO screenshot, okay? So for purposes of this assignment, what I need for Starbucks <clears throat> is here's EV to revenue, here's 2024, 2025. That's based on the current share price. Okay. So 3.5 and 3.16. Now, my valuation which was done last Thursday from my screenshot the EV to revenue at the time was 3.41 and 3.08. So just to sync up, three point four one, three point oh eight. These two numbers are slightly different today. <coughs> okay, five days later. Four days later, whatever it is, 
because the share price has changed, therefore the multiples will change slightly. So I'm just going back to my historical data here. Everybody see what I just did? Don't want to confuse anybody. A lot of stuff happening all at once. All right, same thing. Today, the EV to EBIT for 2024 is 21.42 and 18.62. But last Thursday, based on the share price of 101, those numbers were 20.85 and 18.13. 20.85, 18 18.13. All right, so here's the idea. If I take my EV to revenue, 3.41, and I divide by my EV to EBIT, that gets me a 16.4% operating margin. If I take 3.08 and if I divide that by 18.13, that gets me a 17% operating margin. Okay, So here's the point. What the trading multiples are telling me for year two and year three is somewhere in perpetuity Starbucks perpetuity operating EBIT margin is somewhere between 16.4 and 17 cent percent. Somewhere in that range is probably where most analysts are putting it in their spreadsheets when they're doing the multiples. So if I understand that? So here's the point. If I go back to ratios, the number that I used in homework nine was 19.8. And what the multiples say is this number should be 17 or less. So when we did homework nine, I probably had too high a margin in perpetuity in my as-is valuation, and I need to adjust that, okay? And let's look at this. Like if you look historically, pre-pandemic, Starbucks operating margin was in the 15s. It's really post-pandemic that Starbucks is seeing their operating margin surge to 20%. Said another way, operating margin is based on EBITDA margin. Pre-pandemic, EBITDA margins were around 21%. Post-pandemic, EBITDA margin went up to almost 25%. So all of this operating margin improvement, all of this EBITDA margin improvement post-pandemic, what the trading multiples are suggesting, Starbucks isn't going to maintain that. Now think back to the EIC section, we talked about regression to the mean. Most companies' ROICs regress to the mean, just like growth rates regress to the mean. So that's the point. The market in the multiples is assuming there's going to be some regression to the mean. They're not going to maintain all these increases in margins forever. And there's probably going to be a regression to a more reasonable level of margin. That's what the trading multiples suggest. So in my as-is, I need to reflect that. Okay? So I need to put in a more reasonable operating margin. Now that cell, <coughs> which is M... Right here, this is what's in M9, is white. And we said white cells, I don't want to type in because that will break formulas. So I got to make that number 17% or lower, but I can't do it by changing that cell. So the question is, how do I make that lower? Well, that cell is a function of EBITDA minus depreciation, which means I'm going to adjust the EBITDA margin. That will address the operating margin. So the point is, how do I get 19.8 to 17 by adjusting EBITDA? I need to knock that down by about 2%. Okay. So if I made this 22.6, then I'd be, sorry, 21.6, 3%, and knock it down by 3%, then that would get me closer to 17%. Okay, if I wanted to do 17%, I would make this 21.7. And by the way, at 21.7 EBITDA margin, I'm at the top end of the range of what the trading multiple suggests their EBIT margin would be in perpetuity. So I could actually be more aggressive and make it lower. Right? But whether I made it 21.7 or 
20.7, somewhere in that range, notice what happened to my share price. It's not 101 anymore, it's down to 82. Okay, because what I probably was doing is I was probably too aggressive with the margins to get to that share price, which means if I have lower margin slash ROIC, how do I get a better share price? What am I going to have to adjust? Higher what? Higher G. So that's the point. When we did homework nine, we probably had a lower G and a higher margin. What the multiple suggests is we should probably have a little bit lower margin and probably a little bit higher G. Okay. We're going to probably end up with the same answer, same share price. But I think this is probably more reflective, based on the trading multiples, of what that G and ROIC should be. Again, lots of words, questions about any of that. Why we're doing it? How we're doing it? Okay, so that's the first part. Here's part two. The formula for EV to EBIT. is right here. That's the rearranged key value driver equation, again, coming up later in the book. So here's the point. I know the EV to EBIT multiple. We just looked it up in the real world. Right? I have a pretty good idea what the tax rate is. We use that from the guidance of the company or the JP Morgan report. I have a pretty good idea what the WAC is going to be from Bloomberg, and I don't think it's an unreasonable WAC. So back to, just like we did in our DCF valuation, I just need to figure out a growth in an ROIC. Okay? Now, here's the point. ROICs tend to be more stable and easier to predict over time. That's the proxy for the margin. And from the trading multiples, I have a prediction for the margin slash ROIC. Because if they maintain their productivity of the balance sheet at this margin, that's their ROIC and, and after tax. So the key is I can solve for the G with this equation in the same way that I solve for a G in homework nine and see what the trading multiple G should be. Okay? So that's what we're about to do. So just so you can see what we are doing, I'm going to do two things. One, based on this lecture note, this is the formula we're basing solving the operating margin on Sorry. and I'm going to take Excel So based on this formula, we basically got these two numbers. Okay. Now what I want to do is based on this formula, estimate, re-estimate a G. over here so you can see it. All right, so what are the key elements of this? And I'm just going to put them on this slide just so they're, they're all in one place. So I need a continuing value tax rate. That is going to be from my ratios, continuing values column M, 
tax rate is row 10, so that's going to be M10, 24.5%. I'm going to need a continuing value <clears throat> ROIC. For now, I'm going to use B7 or B6, which is the 2028 ROIC forecast. I'm going to need a continuing value WAC. which right now is cell B4, which is 8%. And I'm going to be solving for a continuing value G in the multiple. And these cells I'm going to make yellow, because I can always play around with them. And that is going to get me to the continuing value EV to EBIT multiple which is going to be this formula. So if those four assumptions come true the result of that is cell C26. So I want to put that formula with the correct order of operations in this cell. So equals left parentheses 1 minus the tax rate that's C22 right parentheses times left parentheses 1 minus the growth over the ROIC well the growth is going to be C25 divided by the ROIC which is C23 right parentheses then I want to take all of that left parentheses right parentheses, and divide that by left parentheses, the WAC, which is C24, minus the G, which is C25, right parentheses, and that would get me an EV to EBIT multiple of 9.4375. It's 9.44. So basically, if I had those assumptions with a zero G, my multiple would be 9.44. The actual multiple in the real world is 20.85. So obviously the G is not zero. It's going to be higher than G. So here's where we can use our goal seek to figure out what that G would have to be to make that formula give me an answer of 20.85. Okay? So basically, tools, goal seek. I want to set cell C26 to 20.85 by changing that multiple G, which is C25. And when I iterate, that's going to give me a G of approximately 5.1%. Okay, So based on the 24 multiples, the G would be around 5.1%. Not homework 9's multiple was closer to 4.3. But our homework nine multiple wasn't using an operating margin that was closer to 17%. It was using an operating margin closer to 20%. So that's the point. If we lower the operating margin, we have to crank up the G. We've got to crank up the G closer to 5%. Now, what would be more realistic? I would argue that this is probably more realistic than what we turned in this morning for our homework assignments because this is based on real world trading multiples. Okay, You're still getting the same stock price. We're just adjusting the growth ROIC combination based on the multiples. Now, just to triangulate one step further, yes, sir? What I put in cell C23 is just the ROIC from up here, the perpetuity ROIC, which is 27.2%. So I'm assuming that that's realistic for Starbucks as well. But if I think it's not, then I could adjust it further. But that ROIC in C27 is going to be based on this EBITDA margin. Okay? So we put in that EBITDA margin and actually lowered the ROIC in our model in perpetuity, okay? which is lowering <coughs> the overall return and therefore lower cash flows. Okay? 
Yes. Because last Thursday, at the time I did my valuation at the 101 and change share price, 101.16, that was the EV to EBIT multiple based on 2024 earnings that I saw in the real world. So using the academic formula, what values equal 20.85? I basically say, what G gets me to 20.85? And the answer is 5.1%. And what I told you at the beginning of this class, law of one price, this G should be the same G in my DCF. I shouldn't have a 4.3% G in my DCF and a 5.1% G in my multiple. That doesn't make sense. So one of those two numbers has got to be right. Now, here's the last thing I'm going to triangulate on, which is I'm going to do the same equation for 2025. So for, again, tax rate in 2025 ratios, M10 ROIC in 2025, I'll use the same perpetuity ROIC, B6, WAC, B4, solve for G, formula, copy over C26 to D26, with no growth, make those four field yellow, I get a multiple of 9.44, their actual trading multiple is 18.13, what G makes it 18.13? Tools, goal seek, set cell, D26 to 18.13 by changing D25, and the answer is a G of 4.5%. So here's the point, file, save as, Starbucks as is, this is section 301, which is also the one I'm doing the video on, <coughs> that what the multiples are telling me <coughs> is a more reasonable G is probably somewhere between 4.5% and 5.1% and a more reasonable perpetuity operating margin is somewhere between 16.4% and 17%. And there are various permutations of numbers in those two ranges that will get to the current share price. But notice, all of those permutations are higher than what I turned in from homework nine today when my G was 4.3% because my margin was gonna to be too high. And that's worth the triangulation of the multiples helps us understand. Questions? And for those of you trying to figure this out, that was the formula with the correct order of operations. It's tricky to get that formula typed in correctly. And again, this is being recorded on video if you need to pause. So here's a final step. And this is where your 500 word write-up comes in. There's a range for G's that the multiples give us. There's a range for margins the multiples give us. What numbers are you putting into your, mo into your model and why? All right? Now, the number I'm using is a 17% operating margin, which is another way of saying a 21.7% EBITDA. But you could actually use a lower EBITDA in perpetuity than 21.7. So where in that range are you choosing and why are you choosing it? You would need to tell me. Now, given where you chose your operating margin slash EBITDA margin, that will affect what G you use. Okay? But here's the point. At that 21.7, let's say I believe they're going to stay at the high end of their operating margin range. If I then go to my G that the model is based on, B7, and I re-goal seek this, so I'm going to set sell. DCF valuation share price, which is D30, to a value of 101.16 by changing the growth in the model, then I'm going to get a 5% G in my model.
not a 4.3% sheet. Which is within the range of the multiples. And so what we've done this afternoon is create a more realistic as is than what you previously turned it. Triangulating based on the multiples. From here, make sure you save this file. You are going to create three more Excel files. This is called the as is. <clears throat> now, in the real world, A and R are the sell side analysts that are covering Starbucks today. <clears throat> and on the A and R screen, you will see that there's a column called target share price. And it is just that. It is what these analysts think Starbucks share price will be worth in the next 12 months. All right? And so a target share price is a 12 month share price target. This is their opinion. Okay? As is is no longer opinion. As is was observed share price. Target share price, which is the second model, is an opinion. What do you think it's going to be? Okay? Notice that these opinions are not equal. Atlantic Equities thinks it's worth 97. Morgan Stanley thinks it's worth 100. BMO Capital Markets thinks it's worth 125. Different analysts have different targets because they have different opinions with different assumptions. Okay? That is model number four that we're going to about to create. But before we create model number four, we're going to create models number two and three called the bull and the bear. The other thing is if you get portfolio theory. Portfolio theory are all about risk reward, which means when they evaluate risk, they evaluate standard deviation. Okay? So translation. I know that you tell me your target stock price. In the next 12 months, how high could it go? And how low could it go? So don't just give me a target, give me a range. And that range doesn't have to be symmetrical. Okay? The high end of the range, which is your optimistic scenario of what could happen to Starbucks in the next 12 months, is called the bull. The pessimistic end of the range, which is the bottom of the range, which is things go wrong for Starbucks, would be called the bear. So models two and three are the bull and the bear. How high could it go in the next 12 months? Reasonably. How low could it go in the next 12 months? Reasonably. With explained assumptions. So that's the other key. You can't just throw in random numbers. you got to tell me why you're using the numbers you're using. That's why we do the EIC. Because if you remember, when we did the EIC, we talked not only about the industry and the competitive advantage today, but what it was going to look like in five years. So there was a forward view of what's going on with the industry. Well, the same is true for our bull and our bear. Okay? Based on what that forward view looks like, if it's a more optimistic view, those are the bull scenario. If it's a more pessimistic view, it's a bear scenario. So what are the EIC drivers? Well, if we haven't done a full EIC, we could at least start out with a BICO. Okay? So let's start out with Starbucks BICO and scan for what the analysts are saying about Starbucks. And so when we scan the BICO, we notice a few things. Number one, what are the analysts talking about? First thing they're talking about, price hikes. So the key is how much price hiking, think about that margin growing EBITDA margin from 20 to 24 percent. How much of that price hikes is going to be sustainable? And oh, by the way, inflation is still problematic. So how much of that inflation cost are they going to be able to pass on to you and go above that? That's going to be critical to our valuation. Okay. Another thing is China. Starbucks is making a big growth play in China. Okay. Was it 1.6 billion people? It's a lot of coffee drinkers over there. It's a, it's a wealth, increasingly wealthy company with a burgeoning middle class. Starbucks wants to get them as addicted on caffeine as they've got the Americans. But here's the point. The U.S. and China are in a spitting match with each other. And it's getting ugly. How does that play out to Starbucks growth ambitions? That's going to be key to Starbucks valuation. Okay? Because if the U.S. and China are, are continuing to butt heads and it gets ugly between us, 
it's going to be hard for, for Starbucks to grow dramatically in that country. Right? And so your view of that is going to play in to the bull of the bear scenarios. Another thing they're going to talk about is same store sales, because one of the issues, as you read through this, is that Starbucks has a lot of stores. And there's a feeling that these stores are cannibalizing each other, particularly in the U.S. So part of their strategy in opening stores in international markets is closing stores in the U.S. to get rid of some of this cannibalization. How's that going to play out? Another factor that's going to play into this is competition. Right? Starbucks is now charging ever more for their coffee. Right? And at some point, Dunkin' Donuts and others are giving you a pretty good cup of coffee at a much lower price. How does competition play into this? Are you still going to spend seven to eight dollars for a cup of coffee, or are you going to trade down and spend less at one of their peers who is going after the premium coffee market? How does that play out over the next five years? All right. So these are factors that are going to affect the bull and the bear. There's different scenarios that could be more optimistic or more pessimistic. That's what we have to contemplate as we value Starbucks going forward. Okay, and. Starbucks is increasingly trying to get into the food business. Okay, so they're becoming more like a McDonald's. It's not just about selling you coffee anymore. They want to sell you sandwiches and other things. How successful is that going to be in their growth? And what kind of margins are they going to be able to get on food? And back to the same thing. How are the competition going to respond to that? And what does that mean for Starbucks? So there's many factors that we, if we were doing a Starbucks valuation, would need to consider when we do our bull, our bear, and our target. So that's where we would start. So in the bull scenario, we take our as is, which we have saved. Model number one. File, save as, bull. I now have my optimistic glasses on. And the question as we do the bull is, what could happen, given that context that I just set, over the next 12 months that would be more optimistic for Starbucks' future? Realistically optimistic. So let's talk about what would change. Do I think the WAC would change? Probably not. Okay. But if I did, I could talk about it. Do I think the tax rate's going to change? Probably not. I think the US government's Congress is so paralyzed, they won't be able to change any tax policy long term. And it doesn't matter who wins the 2024 election because our country is so evenly divided between the two parties that no one's going to win a big enough majority to move the tax dramatically in any direction. So I have a feeling that in any scenario, I'm not really changing U.S. tax rates. I'm going to leave those alone. Now, if you believe differently, you state that and you write that in your paper with an explanation. I also am leaving the balance sheets alone, but that's the point. In my bull scenario, I'm leaving the balance sheets alone. But Starbucks is also increasingly investing in technology. Does that change their balance sheet? Meaning, does PP&E to sales go up because they're may, trying to automate their stores even more to get rid of some labor? And does that essentially change our calculation for invested capital to sales in the future? All right, for simplicity, I'm leaving that alone, but you might choose to change the balance sheet ratios. Okay. Where I'm really going to focus my analysis is right here. What's going to happen to this operating margin slash EBITDA margin in the more optimistic scenario? Could it go even higher? Right? Now, here's the point. If I look at where they're ending up in perpetuity, the trading multiple say EBITDA margin is going to fall to 21.7. And they actually got it up to almost 25% before perpetuity adjustments. So here's the bull. They maintain that. They maintain their increased margins over time. Okay? And that's the point. They, they take their competitive advantage. You keep spending seven, eight dollars in a cup of coffee. You don't trade down to Dunkin' or McDonald's. You continue to buy it at scale. The food that you buy is a premium, and that's also successful. So basically, they maintain their increased margins over time. So instead of 21.7, I'm going to put it at 24. It'll go down a little bit, but not as much. By the way, if they do that, notice my share price is now 119. And China and the U.S. kiss and make up. We realize it's not in our long-term interest to fight each other, that we are better working together, win-win. And so basically the trade tends to simmer down, and Starbucks does have more success in Asia. And with that success in Asia, it does grow a little bit faster long-term. Now, it's already grown pretty fast in the next five years, 
they're going to change it even longer term. So instead of a 5% G, maybe the G goes to 5.3. And you might say, that doesn't seem like a lot. But remember, this is compounding forever. So an extra 0.3% compounding is a lot of growth. And that gets me to a share price of closer to 132. Okay. So my bull scenario, if everything kind of goes in Starbucks way for the reasons that I told you, I think their share price could go as high as 131.88 over the next 12 months. That's my bull. Those are the assumptions I changed. Those are why I changed my assumptions. That is what you have to write up by model. Questions about that? Save my bowl. Close my saved bowl file. Reopen my as is. File, save, bear. Now I put on my pessimistic lens. In the next 12 months, if things start going wrong, what would go wrong? Well, the first thing is back to, even in a bear scenario, I don't think the wax is going to change, and I don't think the tax rate is going to change. So I'm going to leave those off the table. Okay? But in a bear scenario, I think a couple more things could change. First, on this balance sheet, I told you, net fixed assets as a percentage of sales used to be Twenties. Now it's in the forties. <clears throat> what if this number stays high or goes even higher? And I'm going to make this number fifty percent of PP&E. Okay? Because Starbucks, as I said, is spending very heavily on automation, and so all that equipment that goes in the stores, in addition to the stores themselves, suggests they might they might spend more as percentage of sales. Assumption number two. EBITDA margin. Pre-pandemic, their EBITDA was around 21%. So in a bear scenario, they go back to pre-pandemic EBITDAs. All these gains, they don't get. One reason they don't get the gains, inflation remains persistently high, and they are unable to truly pass all those price increases off to their consumers. And number two, to meet their aggressive growth targets, as I said, competition is not sitting idle. They're also introducing their premium coffee, and Starbucks is going to have to be responsive to that. And I think that's going to put a lid on their price caps. Okay? And as I said, they're going to have some trouble in China. All right? I don't think the trade war between the US and China is going to end overnight. So therefore, I think that their growth in Asia in particular is not going to be as high as they expected. So two things are going to happen. Number one, what if their margins in perpetuity get closer to Again, 21%. And what if their long-term growth rate, which was 5%, is only 4.5%? So they're still growing pretty aggressively, other parts of the world, including the US, just not nearly as aggressively as we thought. So growing a little bit slower, 4.5%, growing a little bit lower margins for the reasons that I told you about, spending a little bit more on their stores to try and drive productivity and efficiency. Now my share price. 79. That's my bear. So what I've established is a range. On the low end of the range, I think they could trade as low as 79 in the next 12 months. On the high end of the range, I think they could trade somewhere around 132 in the next 12 months. Where do I think they're going to end up in the range? That's my target. So the final model, save this, I have my ceiling, I have my floor, I have my explanation for the ceiling and the floor. Now I can express my opinion. The target is somewhere between the bull and the bear, by definition. Now I've actually had students in previous semesters that put their target outside the bull and the bear. And I'm just telling you that doesn't make any sense. Because the whole point of the bull is that's the best and the bear is the worst. So you need to be between the best and the worst. Okay? Now we're in that range, it's up to you. You can decide, this is now your opinion. I can't say you're wrong, but you gotta explain your opinion and that's what you're going to be graded on, back to those assumptions that we just talked about. What assumptions do you think are going to play out and why? And what numbers did you settle in on and why? That's what you're explaining, again, in your write-up and eventually in your PowerPoint presentation. That's the target. 
And from that, you will come up with a share price. By the way, your bull and your bear do not have to be symmetrical ranges. So for example, I could have had current share price 101, I could have had the bull at 112, and I could have had the bear at 50, okay? So that's the point. What I'd be telling you is Starbucks is actually pretty much priced as if perfection's happening, and there's just a lot of downside in their stock, All right? So that's the same thing. I could have more, a lower bear and a higher bull, so it doesn't have to be a symmetrical range, but that's the point. What is your rationale for the range, and then where do you think it is on the range that's gonna end up, okay? I will tell you that if I were doing a target for Starbucks, right, here's the key. Whatever price you come up with will create the buy, sell, hold opinion. Because what you do is you take your target share price and you compare it to the current share price. If your target share price that you came up with is within 10% plus or minus of the current share price, that's called a hold. If your target share price is more than 10% of the current share price, that's called a buy. And if your target share price is less than 10% of the current share price, so 90% or lower, that's called a sell. That's how the buy sell hold is created. And if you're like, why plus or minus 10%? Plus or minus 10% is considered a trading range. Right? So that's the point. If I'm JP Morgan and I'm advising BlackRock on buying Starbucks, I'm not going to tell you to accumulate a whole lot more shares if they're bouncing around a trading range because they're accurately valued. Right? That's a hold. Right? The reason I'm going to tell you to accumulate more stock, buy more stock, is because I think they're undervalued. I think there's more than 10% upside in their stock price. That's a buy. And the same thing. I'm going to tell you to start cutting your position if I think they're overvalued and the stock price is going to drop by more than 10%. Get out. That's a sell. Buy, sell, hold. And that's where they're created. They're created after the fact based on your forecast valuations. So back to my own personal opinion. I'm not going to do it here, but I would put them either in the sell or the hold category. Right? Because even when we did the as is, right, Starbucks has some very aggressive assumptions, even in the as is, to get to the current share price today. Right? Remember, their revenue has to grow from 35 billion, 36 billion to 50 billion. Their margin has to go from EBITDA margin from 19% to 25% on that extra 15 billion of revenue. So baked in to the current share price for Starbucks, 101.16, it's pretty aggressive upside already. So the point is, I actually think the market, my personal opinion, has priced in a lot of Starbucks upside at the current share price, which means I don't think that there's a lot more to go. Because when I started to have to create that bull, think about what those assumptions really are to get even beyond what they're already expected to do in the next five years, which is already pretty optimistic. And so in my mind, given where they were historically, pre-pandemic, I think they have more range to not hit those improvements than to exceed those improvements. So when you start putting in those numbers, you start looking more like the bear scenario, and that bear scenario says Starbucks is overvalued. So my target share price is probably gonna be below 101 and probably below 90 if I were to really do Starbucks. And I would say avoid Starbucks. Like, go spend the $7 for the coffee if you want to. I have a dog. I go there and we get the puppuccinos. They throw those in for free. All right? But I'm not going to own their stock. But that's my opinion. You might have a different opinion. That's the fun part of the valuation. But you got to back it up with data and facts. Questions, comments about any of this? Been able to follow what we've been talking about today? Have you made the changes? Yes. So in the ask or in the write up, we first have to explain the rationale for the as is between what whether we're taking sixteen point four percent is that eight yep. percent, is that correct? We're in that range between the twenty twenty four and twenty twenty five multiples did you start and why? That's the first part of your as is. Explain that. And the other variables that you're you know, which are pretty standard. I'm not changing the WAF, I'm not changing the tax rate. Then for the bull and the bear, you're gonna change some of those numbers. What'd you change them to and why? Okay, because this is where the real world comes in. And then the target, what did you change to get to the target from the as is and why? And then what my, it was my buy sell hold based on that. That's what you would have to do as a process. Okay. Questions? I know if there are a lot at you today, you're probably like, I thought we were done last week. No, not done. All right. And by the way, this is pretty advanced, what you're doing here. Okay. And that's why I go back to you can't just plug and chug. 
right? Because this isn't just solving an equation, a very complex equation, but it's not just solving an equation because you got to tell me why you're using the assumptions that you use. And by the way, that is the real value in the world to the sell side analysts. It's not just the numbers they give and it's not just the ranges. It's talk to me about what drives those ranges. And if I believe your assumptions, then I'm going to give more credibility to whatever model that you're actually predicting. And I know we're dealing with the future and no one can ever 100% be right about the future. Right? But the point is, you're giving me some point of view about the future. And that's where your target comes into play. It's your chance to say, looking in your crystal ball, what do I think is going to happen reasonably for a company? On Wednesday, <clears throat> did we do the sign-in sheet today? No. Sorry, I keep forgetting that. All right, so let me start signing. Don't forget to sign it before you leave. So on Wednesday, what we're going to do is, with these changes, we're going to practice in class at another company. I'm going to let you guys kind of go through this, and then we'll talk about it. Okay? For next Monday, homework 10, will be yet another publicly traded company that I'll give you on Wednesday that you will turn in four Excel models, three screenshots, and a minimum 500-word write-up explaining your changes and assumptions across those four models. That's individual homework 10. Okay, that's next Monday. Two weeks after that, you will do the same thing in a 10-minute PowerPoint presentation on a group project company that you will be assigned to. On Wednesday, we'll kind of riff off of a bico and do this in real time. When you do your group project, I would have expected more analysis on what's really going on with that company. So you're going to probably have to do kind of a proxy EIC in order to really do the assumption write-up and some research on the company. You can't just do this as a mathematical model. I don't expect the full work for homework 10. Again, there, if you just kind of quickly look at a BICO and, and make some assumptions there, I'm not going to give you a company you've never heard of for, for homework 10, so it should be that hard. Uh, but nonetheless, this is what we're going to continue to work on in valuation. Does that make sense? Questions about anything? All right, so continue working on your Bloomberg Trading Challenge. The teams that need to get below 300,000, please make sure you get below 300,000 by end of day today. Stay below that. And other than that, uh, if you want to do a peer review, like I said, you have until tomorrow to do any peer reviews for the last project. Question? I have a question. For the TA session, um, are majority of them like online or is it just They're supposed to be in my office, but sometimes they'll send out emails saying they're available via Zoom. Mm -hmm. okay. So you just have to check on them on whether they're on campus or not. But they're supposed to be in my office for physical, okay. physical uh, office hours. All right. See everybody on Wednesday. Don't forget to sign the sign-in sheet before you leave. Where'd the sign-in sheet go? Sorry. All right, so it's right there. Why don't we put it like up here? So the sign-in sheet's over here. Okay. Yeah. 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 Let me stop the recording.